um, Mary Magdalene came to the grave of Jesus early in the morning. It was still dark, and um, she saw that the tomb had been opened, and she supposed somebody had taken the body of Jesus, and she ran and told Peter and, and John. And they came running, and um, John got there first, and, and he looked into the tomb and saw Jesus' clothes folded neatly, his grave clothes. Peter runs by him and goes into the tomb and, and sees the same thing. And, um, and then later, John goes in and, and sees those clothes as well. He goes into the tomb, and it says that going in there, he sees and believes. And no doubt, he, he had a fledgling faith. He didn't quite understand what was going on, but he believed that Jesus had risen from that evidence. And so Mary comes back to the tomb, and, and she's outside weeping. She goes into the tomb, and she sees two angels, and they ask her why she's weeping. And, and Mary says, because they've, they've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. They suppose that his body was stolen. And uh, Jesus appears to her, but she thinks he's the gardener, and he asks her the same question, why are you weeping? And she says the same thing. They've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. And he, uh, he reveals himself to her by just simply saying her name, Mary. And, um, and then she, she says, Rabboni, or teacher, and she rejoices in seeing him. And he goes to appear to the disciples later in the locked room. They're hiding because of fear of the Jews. He reveals himself to them as well. He asks them to, to see his hands and his side. Thomas isn't there. Thomas, when they told him the story, he, he said, unless I see the hands of Jesus and his side and, and put my finger there and my hand in his side, I, I won't believe. And Jesus appears eight days later to the, the disciples behind locked doors, and he calls Thomas. He invites him to put his finger in his hand and his hand in his side. And Thomas is overwhelmed in the sight of Jesus, and he says, um, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, because you have seen, have you believed? Blessed are those who have not seen but believe. And then John concludes chapter 20 by saying that these things are written so that you and I, those that don't see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, would believe. And so that takes us into chapter 21. And so this is another, um, another chapter where Jesus appears to the, to the disciples and they have all places are fishing in Galilee. So let's look at chapter um, 21 verses 1 through 3, and we'll start there tonight. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So here the disciples have left Jerusalem. They go back to Galilee. They're in this area. And Peter makes the decision that he's going to go fishing. And um, are there any thoughts? I'm just curious what you guys are thinking about them going back to Galilee about them fishing. Um, does this strike you in any particular way as to maybe what's going through their mind? Any thoughts? I think it Yes, yeah, Justin. Yeah, I mean, again, they like go out all night, right? And they, they don't, they, they didn't, they didn't have any luck. Um, any other thoughts? Any thoughts at all? I mean, we, we're just supposing here, right? What's going through their mind? Yes, in the back. Yes. Yeah, and. You know, there's, there's a time when this is going to happen, 
but there's confusion. You know, John saw and believed, but it was just, uh, you know, it was an incomplete faith and a not fully revealed faith that would come later. And, you know, I think it's a bit like us, right? When we're, we have some of these spiritual moments and these highs, and then we just kind of go back to life and we want to take life into control and do what we need to do, right? We've got to take care of business. We've got to take care of our life. And that's fine and all, but um, these men are, being, are going to be called to, to do greater things. They were called to be fishers of men, right? If you recall back uh, in the account in, in Luke chapter 5, verse uh, 1 through 11. And so, um, but here they are, they're, they're, they're fishing, and the Lord appears to them. And we'll read verses 4 through 6. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. So they don't initially recognize Jesus. Now, you know, in all fairness, it's, it's, dawn is breaking, the, the boat is pretty far from the shore, and so there's a figure there, and they might, quite, they might not quite see or recognize Jesus, and he may not be, you know, somebody that they're thinking is going to appear. But he says, you don't, you, you haven't caught any fish, have you? And he invites them to, you know, put the net out on the right side of the boat. And, uh, you know, they figured, well, they, they've been fishing all night, why not try again? And so, uh, it's kind of funny that, that Jesus appears to them. He, he sends them out and, and lets them have a full night of unsuccessful fishing. And they're probably frustrated and they're tired, right? And so um, it, it reminds, you know, uh, of the story that, um, that is in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, which we'll read a little bit later. But they, they follow Jesus' advice and they, they weren't able to haul in the fish. There were so many fish because of, of the, the catch, right? And so let's go ahead and turn to John chapter 5. I mean, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 5. Let's go there in our Bibles, Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> and we'll read the account. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It says, Now it happened while there was a crowd pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he said, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gone out to them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. And when he had finished, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let the nets down. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which had been taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So this is sort of a little bit of a callback to that episode, right? And, uh, and as we read on, if we go back to John chapter 21, and we pick up in verse 7, and we'll read 7 and 8, you know, this is maybe what's going through John's mind. As he sees this unfold, he's like, ah, I remember something. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. 
But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And so um, an interesting comparison, right, of the stories that's going on here. And Peter, you know, he takes this, uh, takes this pretty seriously, right? He's, he's stripped down for, for work. He does everything like with a passion, right? Peter's, you know, 100% all in. And so he's out there working hard and fishing. And then he hears it's the Lord. He throws on his outer garment and he jumps into the water. The others come in the boat, but he swims to the shore and he wants to see the Lord. He wants to be the first to see the Lord. It's, it's kind of typical of Peter. And you've got to love Peter, but you've got to be thinking what's going through his mind. And we'll be talking about this in our, our lesson about how to overcome failure and um, some of the pain that his conscience is feeling right now as all of a sudden he realizes the Lord is here. And it wasn't too long ago that he forsook the Lord. And, um, and so as we read on in verse 9 through 11, <clears throat> We, we see that uh, they got, when they got out to the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which, it, you, which you have now caught. Simon Peter <clears throat> went up and drew the net to the land full of fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And so, is there any significance to Jesus having a charcoal fire prepared um, for them? Can you think of anything about a charcoal fire that um, would call to memory something in Peter's mind? Dana. By a charcoal fire, right? So in... In chapter 20, if you look at chapter 20, just go back <clears throat> a chapter and look at verse 21 through 23. I'm sorry, verse, uh, chapter 18. It's chapter 18. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Wait a minute, it's not 20. Ch chapter 18. So I've got it here on the slide. Chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. Then a slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I'm not. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter was warming himself with them, standing there He's at this, at this charcoal fire, right? And then he ends up denying Jesus a second time and a third time, and he's by this fire. And so it's interesting that Jesus, he, he has a charcoal fire made, he has bread prepared, he has fish already cooked, and he says, bring the fish that you caught um, to the land. And so what does Peter do? Does he wait for the others to, to bring the fish? What does it say that Peter does? He drags the net, which they could barely get, you know, to the, to the land by himself, right? So if you read, if you go back to um, John chapter 21, um, Simon Peter, verse 11, went up and drew the net to the land full of fish, 153. And although we're so, there were so many, the net was not torn. So... Again, Peter's all in, right? He, he, Jesus says, bring the net, and so he goes and gets the net. Larry.
correct. Yeah, that's a great point. Robert. Yeah, actually, I had that down as, as a point, you know, to raise. And so um, I think John, through inspiration, you know, writes things for a purpose, right? And he points out, why would you, why would you make a point that the nets weren't torn? And then why would you make a point earlier? Why would, in Luke, it talk about the nets in the, in the passage we read in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11? There were so many fish, the nets began to tear. So I, heard, I saw a hand in Nolan. Yeah, and it's around that, that that he's going to ask him some questions, right? And and he'll have a chance to <clears throat> to really restore himself to uh, to Jesus, Christina. Yeah, and so it's the way that you demonstrate all in, right? So Peter, instead of being, you know, think, act, think, Peter is act, think, act, right? And so, and that's how we are a lot of times, right? Um, some of us. Some of us are a bit more, you know, thoughtful before we you know, launch into action. But, um, but no doubt, you know, Peter, Peter is starting to have um, his conscience work on him. And, um, and, you know, as we'll read on here, We'll see that Jesus um, invites this opportunity for him to deal with that. So let's pick up in verse 12 and look at verses 12 through um, 14. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. Now this was the third time that Jesus manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. It said that, um, it doesn't say that none of the disciples didn't ask Jesus, it says that they didn't dare. Some of your translations may say they didn't dare ask Jesus. And so I mean, it goes back to the point that Larry was making, I think, that is this, what's going on in their minds? I mean, when you really think about it, um, I, I kind of have that question. You know, what do you suppose is going through their minds right now? They've had uh, who they believe is Jesus appear to them, but John makes this point that none of them ventured to question him or dared to question him. Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. You ever really known something but not really quite sure <laughs> I mean it's, it's maybe that's what's going on in their mind any thoughts maybe it looked different perhaps yeah it's like I, yeah. I've had that thought like Mary yeah. didn't recognize them the, the guys on the road to Emmaus like they also didn't recognize them 
perhaps he's the same, but he's different, right? He's manifesting himself in a different way in a resurrected body. And um, we don't really know. I mean, it's not really um, intimated there as to how that, how Jesus looks. But, you know, there's this, still this, this a, bit, a bit of doubt, this, this, uh, this wondering, you know, this grappling with a concept of a, of a um, resurrected Messiah. What does that look like? And what is the end game? You know, we're, we're going out fishing and then Jesus appears again. You know, what are, they're still, you know, really trying to put it all together, I think. And, um, and you can see them struggling with this. And certainly a lot of this will be revealed to them when they have the full Holy Spirit imparted upon them and on the day of Pentecost. And, you know, they begin actively preaching and doing their ministry. Yeah. 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 If any any other thoughts? Yeah. It's just you know there's there's a bit of uncertainty, right? And um, I, I think they realize that it could be no one other than the resurrected Jesus. But I mean, who, who else could it be, right? But sometimes, even though when we know things, we even ask or want to know more, but they're afraid to ask, right? Because they may offend him or something. I mean, there's. There's probably a lot of things going through their mind. And um, we can be a little sympathetic toward that. And, and certainly, you know, the, 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 the story's going to turn to Peter, and we can be a little sympathetic of what's going on in his mind. So let's look at um, 15 through 17. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he, he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. So this interesting exchange that's going on um, that Jesus has with Peter. And um, is, first of all, is there any significance to Jesus referring to Peter as Simon, son of John? Or is it just another name, right? I mean, if you think about it, in John chapter 1, verses 41 and 42, um, when the very first chapter of John, he found, and speaking of Andrew, he, he, he found his first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, and you shall be called Cephas, which translated is Peter. And then, of course, in Matthew um, when Simon Peter confessed Jesus, um, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it upon his confession. But he was, he was named Peter for a reason. It was a rock, right? And now all of a sudden, and he'd been talking to him as, and referring to him as Peter from henceforth, and then he, he asks him this question, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What do you think? Is it a way to just kind of gig Peter a little bit? 
Mary. Yeah. You know, he, he mentions in the first question, he says, do you love me more than these? And so, um, you know, it could be these fish, right, that you drug up to shore in your life of fishing. Or it could be, do you love me more than all these disciples? But I really think it means, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Because you publicly proclaimed that you would not deny me. Right, And so when you publicly did that, I'm going to have this opportunity for you to publicly sort of address this. And um, in Matthew, Matthew's account, Matthew 26, 31 through 35, uh, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away be because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead to you in Galilee but Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too, but, but Peter was the most vocal, right? But Peter just put it out there, Robert. No, I think that's a good point. And, and Richard, go ahead. that confession right that and and so yeah that that 
it's but but Peter was Peter's name was was rock, but it's the confession that he made that uh, that the gates of Hades would not overpower him. Yeah, um, I don't Mark. Yes. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus invites that, you know, that, that, okay, he's probing, right? He's probing the conscience of Peter. And, and as, as Robert points out, he, he's wanting Peter to, to really probe his inner, innermost um, hearts. And, but then he answers him, right? Feed, um, feed my lambs. Um, Prove it. Yeah, I mean, Mark's account said that that um, that Peter denied Jesus by cursing, and Luke's account said that he, you know, Jesus saw him, and so there's a lot going on in Peter's mind, and um, you know, I, I feel I feel a little bit of sympathy for Peter, right? I mean, have you ever really screwed up and really failed? And you know, I was listening to a podcast about um, overcoming failure, and um, Failing forward is what it was talked about, and it, it talked about some of the neuroscience behind um, this feeling that we have, and, and they were talking about the receptors and things that basically um, there's a there's a connection that you feel physical pain the same way you feel emotional pain. Have you ever felt emotional pain so much you hurt, and you just like you're in pain, right? And then they did a study and they gave people Tylenol. And they recovered, they felt better, right? They, they didn't experience as much pain when they had an emotional um, um, an event, a failure. And so that doesn't, you know, that's not my medical advice, go out and take Tylenol, you know, when you <laughs> mess up. And, you know. But it's a point that, you know, Jesus understands, right? He made us. He's understanding what's going through Peter and he's offering, right? But he, he also, he, he calls him to, to action. And so he's not going to say, to Peter, well, just go evangelize. You know, you're going to go out and just evangelize. You're also going to feed my sheep, right? And that's part of being a, of, of the work. Don't just go out and baptize people and give them my word. You've got to take care of these people. I'm the good shepherd, John chapter 10. You're going to continue that work, right, Carrie? Anyone who has done what Peter did will remember that for the rest of his life. Yes. And, you know, when you look at it, he asks him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know that I love you. He's not, he's not boastful. He's not trying to, you know, make it relative to the other disciples' love. He's just saying, Lord, you know. He's, a, he's appealing to, to the Lord's omniscience, right? Lord, you know. And then he says the third time, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. No doubt because he felt like, you know, I mean, how many times, Jesus, do I need to say it? But I think what, to Robert's point, you're wanting to affirm that. You're wanting to, to really bring that out, Janine. Yeah, so, you know, I, I did a little bit of, of, of some of the study in that. And, and actually, um, if you look, 
that verb is used interchangeably, like the father loves the son, that phileo and agape is used interchangeably in, in chapter 3, verse 35, and chapter 5, verse 20. And then Jesus loved Lazarus. Both verbs are used, agape, phileo. So John sort of intermixes that. So there may be some credence to that. And I didn't really want to take that route, though. I, I think what kind of Larry's talking about is, is within this, this, if you were to just pick it up and read it, and of course the words of John when he said that Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And, um, and then he said, Lord, you know, the answer that he gave him was, um, Lord, you know that I love, you know all things and you know that I love you. And so here's where Peter's at. He, he's grieved, right? And it's Maybe because Jesus is continually asking him and his conscience is sensitive, is sensitive and he's feeling like Jesus doesn't believe him. But I think part of this whole confession and everything is getting to a point where we're broken, we're humbled, we're aware of our limitations, and that's where he's at. Lord, you know all things, and you know I love you. He put that together. He just before was saying, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. So I thought I saw a hand. Um, right, Randy. And he commissions him three times, right? He, he says, shepherd my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my lambs. I mean, it, there's a commission that goes with it. And so you're valued, Peter. You're valued, right? Right. Dana. Did you ever walk away feeling forgiven? Because that's what I think Jesus is saying. Yeah. I, you know, you're, you're forgiven for that. Now let's get to work. Let's not wallow in it. We all work for it. Yes. I think it's a, an invitation to put that behind you. That if you love me, then then you're going to then feed my sheep and my lambs, and you're going to tend, and you're going to do that work that I'm going to call you to do, Larry. Yeah, if you and, and I think importantly enough, you're gonna die an honorable death. Yeah. And so compare that to what we had earlier, you know, when he said, I'll die for you. That was all promised. Yeah. This is what's truly gonna happen. So Jesus goes on to provide a little bit of revelation, right? So eighteen and nineteen, um, after asking Peter these questions, he says, Truly, truly I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now, this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me, right? And so, yeah, Peter, you're going to get a chance to, um, even if I have to die with you, right? You're going to get a chance to, to do that. And you're going to glorify me through the death that you're going to die as a martyr, preaching the word. And so as we go on, Peter uh, looks behind him and he sees the apostle John and he asks in verse 20, um, we pick up in verse 20, Peter turned around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if you want if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? 
And so um, Jesus' message is don't worry about John. Don't worry about other people. You follow me. John's going to going to glorify me in a different way. You're going to glorify me in another way. You're going to be the first one who actually will preach the gospel sermon, right? The first gospel sermon. He'll do wonderful things. But he's going to have a different path. And, um, you know, we see that Peter Peter probably died. Um, you know, what happened to Peter? And what, are, what are the thoughts? What, Jessica? Yes. Very popular belief was that he was crucified, right? And, um, and so, of course, Paul would not be crucified in his martyr because he was a Roman citizen, right? And so Romans wouldn't do that to him. But, um, what, you know, and then the story's upside down, right? That, but, um, yeah, I think he would, it was somewhere around AD 64, something around there, yeah. Um, where you go to see Paul, I mean, um, John, John probably died around 98 to 99 A.D. He wrote this gospel somewhere between 80 and 90 A.D. And, and we see that he's the only, thought to be the only disciple that, that an apostle that died a natural death. And then he writes on the island of Patmos the letter of Revelation, right? And ultimately providing uh, inspiration and a message to Christians at that time that, you know, there's hope and there's victory in Christ. And... Um, and so to conclude, we'll just look at the last couple of verses because I think it's interesting how John concludes uh, his, his gospel. And he, he proclaims that this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there is also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John was an eyewitness with Jesus from the beginning. And again, he's writing this, um, this gospel later on in life. And he talks about many more things that Jesus did. And of course, it calls back to um, in John chapter 20, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So many more things that Jesus did, and he uses kind of hyperbole, right? If there were, you know, anything, everything about Jesus, there, there, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to, you know, to contain it all. Um, but there were certainly so many things that Jesus did. I mean, think about his childhood. Think about a lot of aspects. Every day, day after day, all the miracles, all the teachings. I mean, we just have a a shot of those, like, you know, just different perspectives. But we have confidence in knowing that through the Holy Spirit, um, these have been written so that you may believe. It's sufficient, right? All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's all we need. And why we don't have, is, you know, the, the stories of Jesus' childhood or all these other things about Jesus, we don't need that. We have all of what we need. And that was given to us divinely through the Holy Spirit. And, um, and it just calls back to Jesus' point to Thomas, you know, that, that blessed are those who have not seen but believe, right? Because you've seen, you believe, blessed are those who have not seen but believe. And we have everything we need so that we can believe that he has, um, he's the son of God and the believing that we have life. So what a wonderful way to conclude you know, the gospel and how John, you know, put all that together. So any, any thoughts before we, you know, Jessica? I was just a thought that came up because I know this is brought up as to why John was successful, why he was considered the apostle, why Jesus loved him. But um, I was trying to think, you know what it reminds me of this? The relationship between David and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe some of that humanity of Jesus. I mean, we all love everybody here, but there are some people that we're closer with, right? And that's okay. And, um, and, and maybe we see Jesus was that way too, right? Robert, you have the last, last comment.
Yeah, certainly Peter was given the opportunity to overcome his failure, right? To fail forward. And so Jesus forgave him, but he also um, extended trust and that opportunity. And it's a great way for us because through grace we're forgiven, but we need to become active in using that, right? So great class. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.